Hi, and welcome to GM Tips. As always, I'm Satine Phoenix, co-creator of Maze Arcana and a dungeon master on Fury's Reach. Today's theme is alignment. I remember back when I first started playing D&D, life was more simple then, rules were more simple, my character was simple, and all I had to do was tell my GM what I wanted to do, and a roll of the dice and a modifier would inform me on the outcome of the intention. One thing that's been a consistent part of the role-playing discussion through the last 40 years is alignment. Good and evil and the shades in between. Back then you'd pick one of nine alignments to play and that would navigate how you would interact with the world. Lawful good, lawful neutral, lawful evil. Neutral good, true neutral, neutral evil. Chaotic good, chaotic neutral, chaotic evil. What these really do is frame out the crossroads between law and chaos and good and evil. A lawful person is someone who respects, follows, and encourages the law and rules of society. A chaotic person is someone who follows personal freedom, adaptability, and flexibility above the law of the land. Good is someone who has compassion and respect for living things, usually someone who believes in helping others. Evil is someone who acts without consideration or care of the well-being of others, even in spite of harming others without effect on one's conscience, even to hurting and killing out of pleasure. Then there's true neutral. Neutral respects a range of law and chaos and good and evil, but isn't beholden to one over the other. The other shades of neutral express sway in that direction outside of their natural neutral state. The reality is that no one's always one or the other. Playing a character strictly in this way can also be pretty frustrating as a player. Making choices because it's what your character alignment chooses rather than what makes the most sense for the character in that situation. Outright killing something in the name of chaotic evil without consideration of the group you're playing in might lead to an early character death or the other characters might not want to travel with such an untrustworthy adventurer. In our Maze Arcana game, we don't use alignments as the entire world exists in shades of gray. The way nations relate to one another and the many wars that break out, it's never clear who's good and who's evil. Over the last year of playing, each of our characters have changed, some more lawful, some more chaotic, but seem to constantly change based on their experiences. Azure, being non-human, has found she relates to the monsters of Droam more than the humans of the Five Nations. What she thought was good now seems destructive and chaotic. Her wanting to side with the honorable orcs over the greedy, self-righteous humans happened over time, although it might seem to the rest of the nation as if she's turning towards the dark side. What's lawful good to one person might seem evil to another. Your generally good adventuring party who goes into a cave full of goblins to find treasure to bring back to sell for riches actually is a band of murdering robbers from the goblins' point of view. We live in a world of greys and it's more true to our nature as humans to live within this range. Over time, I've stopped worrying about alignment. The characters our party come across influences the decisions my character makes. Like me, my character evolves as the story unfolds. These alignments outline a person's moral code, the foundation of their attitude towards the world, but it's in their experiences and interactions over time and their relationships to others that these alignments shift and change. The most important thing to think about is who your character is to the rest of the party and the world around you. Do you have evil tendencies? Would an evil character come across as evil outwardly to others, or would they seem friendly at first to lure the other adventurers into doing their bidding over time? Granted, there are plenty of folks who still use alignment in their games. Just make sure you let your GM know ahead of time what you want to play and figure out how that works with the group. There must be a reason for everyone to want to be together and want to work together over the span of time. Some games don't allow evil characters or characters that disrupt the collective group dynamic. I could roll on about this, but instead, let's discuss this with musician, actor, and voice of Drist, Jason Charles Miller. Yay! Yay. <laughs> it's Here so I exciting. Am. The voice of Drist. It's pretty awesome. I bow to you. That's wicked cool. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty incredible when I found out about the audition, even. I, you called me? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. And I just said, what do I have to do to get this part? <laughs> oh. And luckily, they were. I didn't have to do anything nefarious, so oh, good. it's good. <laughs> We're here to talk about alignment. In your Back to Basics, mm -hmm. tell us about what you learned. I mean, because you went back all the way back to the beginning. Right. And it was different than the yeah. nine 
uh, kinds right now. So what we did is we ran, on Foreververse, we ran a three-episode arc of basic D&D, the rules that came out in 1980, um, which uh, were even different than the ones that came out in 79 or 81. It was the ones that came out specifically in 1980, which was the first box I ever had that my dad bought for me. Um, and in basic D&D, there were only three alignments, lawful, neutral, and chaotic. So that actually gave us a, a, a huge sort of, you know, a wide berth on, on what to do. Kind of freedom, though, Yeah, too. And knowing the players so well already, because we had already been playing together for months on Foreververse, I sort of assigned characters to them based on their personalities and even their names. So, like, Hector was Ector the Magnificent, <laughs> um, a chaotic elf who... Uh, and that's another thing in basic classes and races were the same. So you, you, you're not a human fighter, you're just a fighter who's a human. Uh, elves are magic users and fighters, halflings are fighters, um, dwarves are fighters, thieves and clerics are always humans. It was a very, it's a, it literally was a very basic version of the rules. But it was a lot of fun because, you know, you sort of threw the rules aside and just played the adventure. Do you find that people played the chaotic characters as if they were evil? Like, how did they interpret what chaotic means? I feel like they did take it more in an evil slant, but maybe they were playing it a little more like neutral evil or lawful evil. But I think like when you see the word chaotic and there's nothing beyond it, your brain automatically goes, okay, I'm gonna be a mischief maker with this guy. Yeah, I think it's really good to look up on to Google or Wikipedia what these words actually mean because when I was studying for this episode, I was enlightened a bit because I had a, a misconception of what things were even though I had a basic idea of what they were. Mm -hmm. But yeah, go look it up on the internet. It's really fascinating. How do you view and use alignment in your games? Well, it's interesting. Like I actually see alignment everywhere. I think I play, like in, in real world and in the game. I think that um, I played D&D for so long and through so many different versions and interpretations of it that um, like I see that alignment chart permanently <laughs> all the time. Constantly so, filling in boxes. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I'm going, oh, that guy's kind of, I think he's pretty, you know, maybe he's chaotic good or he's sort of, wow, you know, he might be lawful good. I think this guy is like a real good guy, <laughs> you know what I mean, or whatever. So. Uh, I think that um, alignment is is an important part of the game, even though I know that like it's not being stressed as much anymore. I love that part of it because it's almost a a guide for the DM and the player if the player's going too far out of the alignment that he picked. You know, that's something that uh, sort of guides your role playing and also as as a GM you can sort of reel someone back if are you sure he would make that decision I, you know if that's the alignment that you really are I don't know if he would do that Oh interesting that you would guide your player that way Yeah I mean I'm not so much hands on I like to let people you know play the game let them have fun but at the same time if a character is a lawful good paladin and all of a sudden wants to do something very out of character, you know, um, up until recently, you could, you know, e even now, you still will get penalized quite a bit in most campaigns uh, for, for doing something that far out of alignment if it's not in, in line with your, with your character's uh, sort of ethos. I, th I think like the, the classic paladin mm -hmm. uh, is, the classic lawful good paladin is sort of a, a prime example of, of how alignment can constrict a character. Yeah, I don't know. I think that it's a good foundation, right? Mm -hmm. But as the characters progress, things change or the people that they interact with, all of a sudden that, that person or monster or whatever brings out something. Yeah. You know, so yeah. what normally, so maybe in town they're lawful good, but outside of town they become more chaotic good or right. chaotic neutral. Like you never right. know because people have that range and I think that characters should have that range. Another thing that's really fascinating to me is lawful good and lawful evil because I've always been afraid of lawful good 
because I envision this character that's like so good and so rules based that, you know, maybe they love their friends, but when it comes down to it, they, they have to do the honorable thing and rat on them. Right. Um, yeah, a lawful good character could be like, um, you know, my, I, my party, I, I, I love the people in my party, but you broke the law, so I'm gonna have to testify against you. That's what I would see a lawful good character doing in a game. You know, like, uh, you know, I, I, I wish we could complete our quest, but I have to turn you into the authorities now. Yeah. You know, so having a lawful good character in any campaign can be challenging if the quest that you're on doesn't lock in with with what that person, uh, what that character believes. Because on the opposite end of the spectrum, chaotic yes. evil, yeah. <laughs> they can do whatever the hell they want. I mean, I, in, in my mind, a chaotic evil character is sort of the ultimate selfish person. Um, it's it's like uh, you know any any sort of any sort of in in modern day like any kind of super selfish character you can think of like on steroids you know they will do <laughs> whatever they want anytime they want to benefit them now they may fall into the constructs of whatever society uh, says they should be and they may follow the law for years until they've got the right time to strike so so they so you don't have to have your character outwardly look like any of those. Right. You can, it's mostly internal anyway. You could be a chaotic evil character that acts lawful good for years. Um, and, and I think that... Dexter. <laughs> <laughs> and I think NPCs too, like it's fun as a GM, you can have chaotic evil NPCs that might be the mayor of a town or the prince that's giving <laughs> yeah. you the quest and you go on four quests for him and it's great and then the fifth quest he totally stabs you in the back. Yeah, you're like, wait a second, you are not as good as I thought. I was following your rules, but your rules were based out of whatever crazy ideas that you have about the world around you. Right. So if you go really deep with alignment, yeah. it's 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 the it's almost like the more power you have and the less fear you have and that's when alignment really shows, you know, shows the true character of people. Yeah, and I think that is really important too, where, you know, you go about your adventure every day and, you know, you're doing your thing, you're camping, you go, but it's under those really stressful situations that it comes out. I right. mean, I've noticed that in my real life. Like there is a version of Satine who comes out, we call her the Dark Phoenix, mm -hmm. and that's like, oh, this is, this is a more, amplified version of what I, I'm capable of. So maybe somebody, like we said, somebody who's good, maybe is a little bit different under um, certain circumstances. Right. Stressful, stress. And throughout a long campaign, um, like maybe one, a homebrew campaign or one that you're doing for many months, you know, if a character is consistently making decisions that go against their alignment, then the GM may need to take him or her aside and be like, look, I, I don't really think that you're neutral good. I think you're more neutral evil now. And we should uh, talk about, um, you know, what penalties or benefits that, that um, will give the character or take away from. I wouldn't even discuss it, honestly. I would just be like, okay, that's how you're playing this now. And then change the environment around that character. So perhaps the character is, you know, is a divine character. Mm -hmm. Well, what is the, what is their, the person they worship, how, how do they think about this change? Well, sure. You yeah. could be in the middle of combat and find that you don't have any spells left anymore because you abandoned uh, the the uh, the motto of your god or the, exactly. the the vision of what your god wants you to do. So, so that's do do whatever you want. Do whatever okay. you want, players. I'll remember that <laughs> the next time I'm in a campaign with you. <laughs> yeah, you better. <laughs> we're gonna jump into the last three questions that I ask everybody, and we're gonna make the answers super quick. Okay. Pre-game house rule. Um, I take this actually from my friend Jay Schultz. And when he was DMing our game, uh, no cell phones, no checking your cell phones will have breaks and you can do it then, but he wanted your absolute attention. And if someone were to like look at their phone or if the phone was ringing, the whole game would stop. You know? And I think that's actually kind of a cool rule. Yeah. And it makes the game go quicker uh, and flow better. Agreed. What is your favorite GM moment? 
My favorite GM moment was I had created this amazing underground uh, dwelling that I wanted my characters uh, to get to so that we could use that as a base of, um, of operations. But of course they needed to clear out the monsters that were there. And so uh, the, my favorite GM moment is when they cleared out the, cleared out the, um, the underground base and took it over for themselves and then we could run our campaign from there. And that was like a very satisfying moment. Nice. Quick tip to the audience. Um, there've been a lot of great quick tips on this show, uh, but I had something I wanted to reveal, a yes. secret. So this is a special secret. So um, for years and years, um, when I would be interviewed uh, for Godhead, people would ask, they would always ask, oh, your band's name is Godhead. Where did you guys get that name? And my sort of blanket boilerplate response was, well, Godhead means the closest thing you can be next to God. So for a lot of people, that's religion. Sometimes it's their job. And for us, it's our music. And then we go, ah, and that was like my deep answer. <laughs> but the real answer of where I got the name Godhead for my band was inside this issue of Fantasy Gamer, um, which I believe at the time was sort of a competitor to Dragon Magazine. Which, 1984. Yeah, which I had, which I had a subscription to. So uh, I had this since I was 12, and there was something in here that made me go, that would be a great name for a band. And here it is right here, the Haven of the Godhead. And at age 12, I said, one day I'm gonna have a band named Godhead, and it was from this issue of Fantasy Gamer, and that's really where our name came from. That's amazing. <laughs> oh my God, thank you for sharing that. That's gold. Oh wow, thanks. That was an amazing show. Thank you for joining us here on Geek and Sundry. Thank you, Jason, thank for you. joining us. I love your brain. Where can we find you on the internet? JasonCharlesMiller.com. Uh, on Twitter, I'm Jason C. Miller, and every other social media platform, Jason Charles Miller. Um, also, you can find me every Thursday right here on Geek and Sundry's YouTube on Foreververse. Awesome. I'm Satine Phoenix. You can find me at Satine Phoenix. You can catch me every Sunday on twitch.tv slash mazearcana in Orphan Echo and on Tuesdays, Dungeon Mastering Fury's Reach on twitch.tv slash dnd. And on Sagas of Sundry, Dread on projectalpha.com. Which I did the music for, too. That's true. Yeah. Can you do something else for us? Sure. Would you GM us out of here? The last thing you remember was you were on watch. It was second shift, which is always the worst watch. A few hours of sleep, and then you were being kicked awake by your no malugenous party member. Hey, it's your turn. That's the last thing you remember. Now, you're all alone in a prone position. You're looking around and you realize your entire party is gone. A few, more, a few more moments and you realize your party's not gone. You're in a different place. The forest is different. The trees are wider, taller, and they're black. You reach out and touch the tree closest to you and you realize it's petrified. You try to stand and then you realize your feet are bound. You reach down to try to pull the ropes away and those aren't ropes. They're webs and now your hand is stuck. The next thing you see are two red eyes coming closer and closer to you. And you hear echoing everywhere, even inside your head, the words, who sent you? Roll for initiative. <laughs>